Everybody, final thoughts time for Castell, which is a really offbeat, oddball game. And I'll admit, I went in expecting not really to like it because when it boils right down to it, Jen and I, we very rarely find ourselves having any interest in any type of sports theme game, even a really oddball, off the wall sport like human tower stacking, which people of Catalonia are so obsessed with. I, still, I was expecting, yeah, it's going to be, oh, I'm just trying to score as many uh, touch point goal downs as you are, and whoever gets the most, I just wasn't really interested. And I have to admit, you know, the subject matter is just kind of strange. I, I, I appreciate that it's something new and different, but it just didn't really appeal to me. I actually looked at some video of real Castell Towers, and I think, well, that'd be quite the spectacle to see in real life. But otherwise, I'd rather just build something that's meaningful and real as opposed to, you know, just kind of a silly flight of fancy. So, I didn't go in expecting it to be uh, particularly enticing to me and Jen, but we were really blown away by just how interesting and clever the puzzleness of this game is. And quite frankly, as is often the case with modern designer board games, I could imagine putting a different theme on and using the same gameplay mechanisms? Not this time, because the, the crazy um, Rube Goldberg-esque nature of trying to come up with the best stackable pile of humans and training them in five different distinct skills that will allow me to break the rules for how I stack them is just an almost endlessly fascinating puzzle. It is just a blast. Saying, like, okay, well, okay, if I get one more seven and I do mixing, then, oh my god, I'd be able to suddenly double the height of my tower. Or I'd be able to, oh, and then if I just get one more ten, and there's several tens, I could actually complete that objective over there. Um, there's really nothing else quite like it where, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you find these different ways to build wider and taller, and then, oh, just tear it down and now completely build it a completely different way somewhere else. Uh, it needed to be this theme to create this really interesting, unique puzzle that is compulsive and compelling and definitely fun. Jen and I have definitely enjoyed this game in spite of the theme, although, well, like I said, indirectly kind of because of the theme, because it allowed for like a central gameplay puzzle that just wouldn't fit any other theme that I can imagine. Anyway, it's neat, it's sharp, it's fun, it's fast playing. There's a lot of setup variability. Every time you play, you're going to be, well, really, there's only so many places you can get points from, you know, um, competing in the festivals or trying to complete the little side things. And actually, I, I, I regret not having spent a little bit more time in the run-through talking a bit about how scoring works. Because well, not only is the central puzzle of how best to stack these people interesting, but the puzzle of how to best go about efficiently scoring points is interesting too. Because this game really rewards variety. Not just getting good at one thing and then doing it over and over again. Those little tokens, when you um, complete a, uh, a little regional challenge or when you uh, do well in a festival, those tokens you take, you put them on the region you collected them in. And the thing is, the more regions you collect stuff from, the more points you get. That could be the majority of your points in this game comes from the fact that, oh, I just did a bunch of little things all over, um, the, all over the board. As opposed to, well, no, I got really good at one thing and I just kind of drilled down in these areas and stayed here and did a lot. Uh, you're really limiting yourself. The game wants you to travel far and wide because you'll get more and more points. And also, um, just because, yeah, you know, I've really rocked all these... Uh, uh, these tens, and I'm probably going to uh, grab a lot of those ten bonuses in every festival I do well in. Well, that's great the first time you take a majority of tens, because that's worth two points. Every time you do it after that, it's only worth one point. So everything in this game has diminishing returns if you repeat yourself. So the game, again, encourages you not to do that. To right, And because the whole central crux of this game is, hey, once I've built this tower that I was trying to do for whatever region, I can tear it all down and now glue it back together in a completely new and different way. You want want to do that so that you can go to a new region and get more variety of points. That's really, really great. And another thing too, um, I love the fact that you think, oh, well, yeah, no, I I'm just going to focus on festivals. I'm going to be really good at festivals to, um, you know, and just really win all those things. That's not as powerful as you think. Because, say, the, the first festival you did, you made a tower that was worth 11 points. Like, yeah, that's an awesome first tower. And then say you went to another t uh, festival, and yeah, the next time, because of the uh, the types of people you had to use or whatever, you, uh, you scored 10. So you think, oh, I scored 11 and I scored 10. I've made 21 points so far. Uh-uh. 
you've made 11 points because at the end of the game, your base score is only equal to the best festival performance you had. So just focusing on festival after festival after festival is not going to get you across the finish line in a winning position because um, it's only one of those festivals will ever give you a big score. Now, to be fair, uh, you still want to get in those other festivals because even if you don't win a given festival, even if you just place, that's one more thing you've done in that given region. Because remember, a big chunk of your points is going to come from doing stuff all over the place. And that's cool. That's very fresh, very different, really kind of mixes it up and kind of um, doesn't let you get in a rut and forces you to think and rethink and rethink all the way through this game as you're planning from turn one what you're going to do in turn 10. And that's really awesome, especially if you play the way I was demonstrating, the more hardcore variant where one of the uh, training spaces on the wheel is no training. Uh, the other side, which I didn't show, which is you can train this anywhere. That means every round when you get to where you're training, wherever you are, you have two choices, the training available in that region and the training. Uh, style that's available in every region. So you have a lot more flexibility about how to grow. Uh, but actually, Jen and I, we definitely enjoy it. We played this twice now. One is the basic and one is the advanced. We enjoy the advanced because it really pushes us hard and really makes us work. So, like I said, there's a lot to like here. Uh, it's fun, it's quirky, it's silly, but it's surprisingly crunchy in a really, really great way for several different reasons. Now, that said, there's a couple things that bother me about it. Mostly as a two-player game. It kind of feels like, well, actually, I don't know. It kind of feels like the scaling is a little bit off, but I could be wrong. It could, I mean, like I said, we played this twice, and while we have felt like there was something a little bit off, we haven't actually seen it reflected in the final score. So maybe everything's fine, but there's two things that they just kind of gnaw at me a little bit. One is every, um, uh, you know, every, uh, uh, every odd round, the first, the third, the fifth, the seventh, and the ninth round, the board gets reseeded with new Castellers. And in a two player game, there's all, uh, the first player of the game is going to be the first player every round that happens. And that means that player, whoever was first at the beginning of the game, gets first dibs on everybody that comes in new. And that means if the circumstances are right, particularly in a two-player game where you know exactly what your opponent might want, because you can see what they're doing, you can pay attention to what they're doing, you could really try to play a denial game. And the other player doesn't have that option, because the second player in turn order is always second for the whole game and doesn't get anything to make up. Doesn't get like an extra couple of points at the beginning of the game, doesn't get an extra special action token, doesn't get an extra Casteller drawn around, nothing to make up for the fact that they are always behind the eight ball, they never get first dibs on stuff that comes out. Now, I don't think that's going to be a big problem in higher player counts because a lot more stuff comes out. And in a four-player game, uh, whenever you refill, there's five things put in every space. So a ton of Castellers are going to come out. But in a two-player game, because the, the lower the number, the more rare it is, it is not at all unreasonable to say there will only be a few ones or twos, and one player could totally dominate whoever happens to be the first player. Like I said, we played the game twice, and it hasn't been a defining feature of who won or lost. It just kind of felt wrong. It felt like the second player should have gotten some money for it. That said, the folks at Renegade Game, they are proving themselves to be very good developers. So I'm willing to take it on faith that it's fine, that it maybe it feels wrong, but it's still okay and it doesn't have an impact. The other one, again, is a two-player specific thing. No matter the player count, in every one of the regions, there are two of those objective tiles that come out. And in a four-player game, that means, well, I mean, you know, everybody's going to try to go for a few of those because that's all where a ton of points can be had as well. You can't win in every festival. And even if you do win in every festival, that's not going to do you that great because it's only your best festival that really is the big scoring opportunity. So you want to hit some of those other little displays along the way. Um, and if you're playing with three other players, those are going to get gobbled up. But in a two-player game, there's an equal number of them out there on the board. And that just struck me as weird. It just means it's going to be, in a two-player game, much easier to do better at those exhibitions those regional expeditions, exhibitions, then it would be at a higher player count because there's, you're just not as competing for as many. Um, and that struck me as weird. I almost wonder why, hey, okay, if, if, if I'm in a region and I do one of these two things in a two-player game, the other one is immediately excised to kind of emulate uh, a four-player game where, you know what, other players are taking these other things. But in a two-player game, oh, I can do that one. And then immediately after, I can do that one if I want because with only one other player, chances are they're not all getting gobbled up. And again, like I said, I've played this a couple times. It doesn't really necessarily feel like anything's broken about the game, but it just feels weird. As a as a 100% two-player gamer, I'm always just kind of sensitive to the fact that when I'm playing and I'm thinking, you know what, this would be so much different in a four-player game. It would be so much harder. I would have to, there'd be a lot more tension for me to try to get to the right place at the right time to do this thing because with three other players, chances are it'll disappear before I get there if I don't move fast. In a two-player game, I didn't feel, the, the attention that I would imagine is there, I didn't feel. 
Like I said, I've only played as a two-player, so maybe it's not an issue. But it just kind of struck me as weird. Uh, it's kind of like the equivalent of, oh, in a four-player game, every time somebody finishes one, a new one gets randomly put in its place. Uh, it, it almost feels that way, but it, it's not. So, like I said, in spite of those niggles, Jen and I have really enjoyed it. So much so that, well, for now anyway, this is staying on our shelves, which is a tough uh, cookie to crack these days because I'm about to move internationally and I'm trying to have fewer games on my shelf, not more. But we have really enjoyed this. In spite of all the stuff that made me think I was going to be a one and done, get her out of here, this uh, has really tickled our fancy. It's a fun, fun puzzle to solve. Um, and, uh, oh! One other thing I will mention. It also comes with a very elaborate insert that clearly a lot of love and attention was put into. I have to make normally I don't talk about inserts. I don't even pay attention to them. But this insert in this box feels to me like it was designed by somebody who doesn't understand how the game is played and it actively makes the game worse. I will show you. I will show you this insert. Um, because, of course, the thing about this game is it comes with this gigantic bag that is bigger than my head! Um, and what you want to do is, there's 150 tiles in here. You just, after you're done, you're done playing, you just want to throw all the tiles back in here and just fold it in and put it... Uh, and, you know, that's how I tried. But you, if you do it that way, because of the insert, you literally can't close the box all the way. Because the way this insert is supposed to work is, after you're done playing, after you've played for an hour, an hour and a half, you are supposed to empty all 150 tiles out of this bag and and put them very carefully sorted into all these other perfectly designed fitted areas so that everything has its perfect little spot. It's very cool for um, you know the, the anal retentive folks who, who love to have all this stuff. It's great, everything's gonna be held in tight by the, you know, that's really wonderful. But it makes no sense because um, there's 150 of these tiles. I have to spend 10 or 15 minutes sorting them into 10 individual piles and then slip them all into these slots solely so that the next time I play, I will pull them all out, dump them all back into this bag, and randomize them again. Why? What is the point of that? Why is this here? Because the problem is, if I just leave all these tiles in here, this gets really fat, and then this uh, insert is big enough that I can't close the box tightly. I don't get that at all. It's absolutely crazy. Um, and again, I don't, I don't know why that choice was made. Like I said, it, it doesn't matter. Just toss the insert, folks. That's what I'm thinking I'm going to do, in all honesty, because it just acted. Oh, and also, Renegade, come on, don't do this to me. You wasted a whole page. Particularly because I, I found myself so interested in this Castell thing. I mean, I knew about them. I never paid much attention. I ended up going on Wikipedia and learning more about them and reading interviews and how, you know, even though it seems like a really dangerous sport, I mean, football, or what Americans know as soccer, is statistically a more dangerous sport than this. And, um, although, in, in 150 years, only three people have ever died doing this, although the most recent one, I think, was in 2006, when a 12-year-old girl died, which is, and only after that, only in 2006, did the kids start wearing helmets. Really interesting stuff. A whole page could have been devoted to all this background for people who suddenly find themselves interested. Or, ah, oh, that was weird. I always complain about this. What is the up with that? Look at that. That's such a waste. But I am so scraping the bottom of the barrel for things to complain about here, folks. Because on the whole, this is a sharp, fun game, and we've really enjoyed it a lot. That's it, folks. That is Castell. Thanks very much for watching. Have a very, very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Oh, bye-bye.